A writer and reporter for the sports website Deadspin is coming under major fire for accusing a little boy and his family of racism. It was a full Native American headdress, and to go along with it, half of his face was painted black, half of his face was painted red. A big plot twist this morning. You know, some people have accused that young a boy of being racist against Native Americans and African Americans, but overnight, the boy's mother posted on Facebook that her son is actually Native American. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. <laughs> Just a catch of strays over here. <laughs> You're in for a hell of a show. Keep the faith, hold the line, and own the libs. It's time for our main event. Ah, welcome back to the Ruthless Variety program. We're down one today, fellas. We are. Sad. He's the comfortably, very comfortable smug today. Yeah, ec extra comfortable smug. <laughs> <laughs> but we always miss our friend when he isn't here. We miss our friend. We miss our friend, but we will have him reunited shortly. Uh, we got a big show, and I think there's a lot to talk about. We're going to try to have fun as we do on Thursdays. Yes. Mm -hmm. We like to have fun on Thursdays. Yeah. First of all, did you guys, the top of the show. Mm-hmm. The, the, this thing with the, the Native American headdress with the kid, first, Deadspin. For those yeah. of you who don't know, Deadspin is like left wing sports journalists. Yeah, I, I, I thought that fell out of fashion a couple I, of years ago. I don't know where, what's the constituency for such a thing? I don't know. Good on them for still grinding it out. <laughs> <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> How many, like, Serious sports fans, do you know that are just left wing lunatics? Well, it's it's not the fans, as ESPN's audience declination would suggest. Yeah. It's actually the inside of the editorial department at Sports Illustrated and ESPN, and everybody on the left who's That's who working in sports joint? journalism and who is trying to rise up in New York. Oh, mm. that's, well, that's, that's an interesting the take. That's the audience. It's it, it like if Keith Olbermann is an anchor for Sports Center. You know that there is a left wing tint in sports journalism, and those guys are going after that. Imagine being a journalist of any stripe and looking up into the stands of a major football game and seeing a child and objecting to their outfit yeah. to the point where you've written articles outing a kid as being, <laughs> first of all, a kid doesn't have the capacity of being a racist. He doesn't know. He's from the Midwest. <laughs> they're, they're, like... well, you got to understand, man, they're trying to recapture that Trump presidency magic that these journalists found in turning out Rage into Clicks. Remember, like, Nick Sandman and yeah. Covington mm -hmm. Catholic? Great point. That's Remember what that? this reminded that's, me of. That's what this is, right? Yeah. Like, they're trying to restart the click economy on outrage of, you know, everybody's racist. Which is so hilarious in this case, because then they did like an interview with the family and they're like yeah we're actually native american <laughs> and the grandfather is like it, he's high in, up like in the legit tribe. like legit in the tribe yeah <laughs> yeah yeah not like not like elizabeth warren status no. like i did a gene genealogy test and i'm two percent you know like like og legit I don't know if you guys saw this, but the reporter who wrote this story originally has deleted his tweet. Oh, no. Oh, really? He has. It went backwards on him. He knows he was wrong. Oh, jeez. Well, I hope there's some accountability. There certainly was for Sandman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we want to thank you all for the viewership. I'll be honest. It has been extremely gratifying to see all the Spotify tweets. Yeah. You know, because at the end of the year, if you listen to this show on Spotify... Spotify sends you your consumption of shows and music or whatever throughout the year at the end of the year. And, and we've gotten them and they've been all over Twitter here over the last day or two. Uh, an amazing amount of ruthless listeners listen a lot. Yeah, Spotify wrapped. It, it, it's actually really cool the way that they do it. They let you like go through all your consumption from the year and like the music you most listen to, the genres, the podcasts, all that sort of stuff. We've seen a lot of them. I absolutely love it. I also... I, I saw some people post them, and uh, the number of minutes I was very impressed with. Well, did you notice how competitive our audience is with each other? Because some of them will say, well, I'm in the top 1%, you're in the, only in the top 2%, yeah. and they're just like dunking on each other. <laughs> <laughs> but also, like to get to the top 2% yeah. of our audience, you have to dedicate like a week plus mm -hmm. all day, every day of your life over the last year. 
Yeah, well, I mean, for our listeners who maybe are new to the Variety program and you listen to uh, this show on Spotify, you know, maybe dip into the back catalog. You know, between, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas now, maybe you have a little bit of downtime. You yeah. Know, go pump those numbers. If you want to win, that's what you'll do. Yeah. That's what you'll do. <laughs> that's what you do. We also appreciate greatly all of you who have visited the merch store yeah. for your Christmas gifts. We have a ton of of awesome stuff and i nikki spaghetti and wolf tell me that like these things are flying off the show it's popping off yeah yeah all all of the old man's hard work is (laughs) is really coming to fruition (laughs) come on it's you know most of the day he's back there stitching he is (laughs) (laughs) sewing on labels do you imagine (laughs) well i mean get a gift from us and we can also give a gift to you we are going to do a very special thing i, I can't tell you the exact date yet but between now and christmas a q a episode yeah and this is this is something brand new yeah we haven't done this before we've been talking to people in their earbuds for three years and now they have an opportunity to contribute to the ruthless variety program what yeah. a great idea yeah and if they go to hello at ruthlesspodcast.com. Send an email there. Send your questions, and hopefully we have the time to get through almost all of them, but we're going to do a full show on just your questions. Yeah. Because there's a lot of that. And, you know, the thing is, is like we don't, the beginning of all of these shows, we just get right into it. We don't do a lot of like bio or questions about the show or how we came up with certain things or whatever. Like, uh, let's entertain some of that. If you come to a live show, you get a lot of that. Yeah. We'll give you the full explanation. I hope there's a lot of pent-up demand. Yes. You know? I hope so, too. Because we get it a little bit in some of the five stars. You know, people um, will compliment the show, and we appreciate that, obviously. And then they, like, get in one question that they had. And I appreciate that, too. I think it's just, it's appropriate at this juncture that we give people a whole show. Yeah, absolutely. And I will, uh, listen... To the Ramaswamy staff, who believes that we're going to screen out your questions for the old man, we will not. Oh, no. I will protect every single one of you and make sure- You don't have to protect anyone, pal. <laughs> I would do it with vigor. <laughs> yeah, but I really, I hope, that, I hope that they take their time and construct a very well-argued set of points. Yeah, just remember the old man's yep. got the microphone, yeah. so it's got to be well-argued. Mm-hmm. It's got to be well-argued. Anyway, we've got that coming up. Again, we'll make an announcement about when exactly that is, but th- get those questions going because we're going to start start in on that. As we do on Thursdays, fellas, we do our five stars. And to start that every week, we go to The Voice. Well, friend, this first one comes from Sarah in Texas, and her title is Respect, Love, The Program. Sarah in Texas writes, I'm yet another listener who followed you after hearing on Megan Kelly's show, but it was by your own merit, you rapidly became one of my rare must-listen Well, by podcasts. our own merit. Yeah, it's thoughtful. Yeah. How about that? I came for the humor and stayed for the animals. Yeah. <laughs> Listeners, beware. The animal kingdom is on the move. <laughs> I don't get the anger over hearing a candidate's opinions and don't interpret it as an endorsement. Thoughtful. Yeah. yeah I mean, somebody who gets it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We all know not a one of you is shy about sharing your real opinions. I appreciate that you trust me to hear them and be able to make my own voting decision. Isn't that nice? Thoughtful. I like it. God. I mean, what a wonderful comment. It's a nuanced and rational take. It's almost like a well-adjusted individual. (laughs) She she says, however, I have an opinion for you. Oh, good. Okay. Seriously, reconsider Smug reading the credit card point script. (laughs) He does not care to have points for school supplies, and any travel miles he saves would be ruined by children using... Those aforementioned school supplies. Love you all. Stay ruthless. We're talking about our advertisements. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have advertisements. And it's an attack on smug, which I really appreciate. <laughs> you love that. <laughs> you you absolutely love that. And it comes at no better time than when smug's not here to defend himself. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate. <laughs> I love that. Okay. All right. Dunks, what do we got? Uh, this is from the Air Snake. Title is Five Star Review. Right to the point. I like that. Dear fellas. Thank you for your always lighthearted yet astute political analysis. I look forward to a banger of an episode every Tuesday and Thursday and appreciate getting the latest in both people and animal news all in one place. Mm. 
much like that snake once trapped around the claws of its hawk predator. I became hooked on the program the day I found myself laughing audibly in public at Smug's commentary on the aforementioned story. (laughs) No one expected the air snake. (laughs) And while I almost always agree with what you all have to say, animals and otherwise, I do have one point of contention. Good. I believe it is the octopus and not the whale that may provide the most sustenance in a dire situation. Interesting. Mm. Sure, whale blubber has far more calories, but think about it. Once that fat is gone, it's gone. Mm. Octopi have eight nutritious and delicious legs (laughs) that can continually regenerate (laughs) after you eat them. Is that real? Yeah. Like you just cut it off and they grow back? It's like, you know, what do they do? Uh, stone crabs are the same way. Yeah. Mm. And it's it's a very good point because we always talk about whales as a renewable resource. Yeah. Yeah. And well, this is ge- legitimately renewable. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh, keeping you alive as long as you <laughs> you can keep it alive. So you're just like feeding the octopus so it can grow back legs for you to eat. Well, you got like you got to, I, I imagine you have to bandage It's a self-sustaining economy. But you got to bandage them appropriately. You don't want to have... Like, I imagine there's some blood loss associated with the loss of the leg. I, there's only one way to find out. Yeah. Well, also, can we get a fish? Well, can we get some kind of an aquarium for experimentation? Can you imagine the smell? <laughs> <laughs> it and, is, and, with, with under the hot lights, the algae blooms would be insane. Yeah, but Nikki Spaghetti would take care of that. Yeah, Nikki can handle it. We'll get him a skimmer. Okay. Okay. Uh, back to the uh, review here. Also, I could probably take down a parenthetical legless giant octopus with my bare hands. <laughs> Wait, just a, it's a blob, right? It's just right? a blob at that a point. Legless octopus. <laughs> but let's hope the world gets its act together and it never comes to this. Thanks again for all you do. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. Very I good, love that. very good. Uh, all right, I've got one additional. I believe we have a graphic up for it. Um, this comes from an incredible, incredible listener. Uh, thank you so much for your show. I'm a 93-year-old female fan who really loves your show. Man. You four are so good. I have four sons, and I'm a guy mom. Keep doing the right thing. We need it. Uh, I love man. it. 93. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. You got to love that. And you got to love just a straight-up sense of humor at 93. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I respect a, a, you know, a guy mom. Uh you know, my mom is a, a frequent listener in the Variety program. Has lots of thoughts on all of you, gentlemen, when well, you attack me. And not all great. No, she doesn't. She doesn't appreciate when we attack the old man. Yeah, I'm sure she'll be writing in at some point. <laughs> 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 I look forward to that. Uh, Wolf, do we also have? We also have a, another a hand delivered. Hand delivered. A hand delivered five star review. Uh, the voice wow, may want the box. honor of reading. Let me sort through what we've got here. Uh, there's a letter, a hand. We never get a hand delivered. This is a first on the variety program. A, a yeah. first. A touch of class. Oh boy. There you go. I'm going to sort through the rest of this. Well, this is a it's real, a, it's a real treat. To the fellas. To okay. the fellas. Okay. Well, it's addressed, fellas of the program. Long-time listeners, first-time callers here in Arizona, yeah, a state we love so much here on the Variety Program. Please forgive our state for its love affair with losing easily winnable elections. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a love affair there. We found you through the one and only Katie Pavlich, dear friend of the program, years ago and have not missed an episode since. The Variety Program continues to make us laugh while providing interviews and political insight we can't get anywhere else. We were looking forward to attending a live event in 2024. However, as of November 2023, we're grounded due to our respect for the smug rules of air travel. (laughs) (laughs) That must mean children. (laughs) And lack of confidence that our newborn will be fully compliant to them. (laughs) He's, he's literally shamed parents out of air travel. I think that was his goal all yeah, along. No. This is a great writer. By the time our son has demonstrated an ability to abide by the rules, we will not be able to afford to come east on any airline except Southwest because of Bidenomics. Yeah. As God. a self-respecting people, we will stay home. <laughs> Thoughtful. It may be true that the country is falling apart and that the libs are destroying the American dream in sacrifice to their false weather gods. <laughs> oh, listen to this. But we in the Pavlich family uh? are taking on the most pressing issue of our time, the animal kingdom uprising. 
Ah. Uh. Yeah, these. Well, Katie's long been yeah. a, a huge advocate for eliminating threats. She sure has, and and I feel like every child in that family has been raised exactly right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Under the authority of modern common sense and the traditional gospel of Luke, where he proclaims, "Quote, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions." <laughs> that comes from Luke ten nineteen. Mm-hmm. There you go. I have taken a shot across the bow at the origin of this evil and made it into an example for you to place bourbon upon. <laughs> <laughs> this what is a, genius stuff. What a kick. If we all continue to have the courage to do the right thing, we will prevail as a nation and a species. <laughs> 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 Keep the faith, hold the line, and own the libs. P.S. It's highly disrespectful to question the King of the Hill judgment issued by the Honorable Katie Pavlich. That's right. Oh, yeah, it was disrespectful. I agree. And this is signed Paul and Courtney Pavlich. Oh, this is just fantastic. And there's some gifts associated here. Oh, my there's, gosh. There's some things in here. Oh, it's got our, it has our names on it. Yeah. Holy smokes, it looks like a rattler. Yeah. Look at that. Oh, my God. It's a coaster. A coaster for my beer. With, oh, this is incredible. Snake, this is incredible. Snakeskin coaster. And here's the best the, the the best part of all of this, guys. Yeah. It was hand delivered by none other than Katie Pavlich. You're kidding. Yeah. Wait, it, wait you're saying so that So she's gotta come on the program, I, doesn't she? Can't just wait in the lobby for all of this. No, I think let's you're get right. let's get let's get Katie in here. Yeah. Let's get Katie in here and serve her up a beer and just get her comfortable and uh we will you know, it might be a second or two of dead air, but what are you gonna do? <laughs> what are you gonna do? Hello. Hey, fellas. How are you? Oh, I'm great. How are you? Oh, I just couldn't be better. Just oh, look couldn't at this be better. Nice coaster we have here. What a nice coaster. Where'd you get that from? I, you know, <laughs> it's very Paul, thoughtful. You've got uh, an incredible family, as it turns out. So I got to tell you the backstory of these coasters. Okay. Um, as mentioned in the letter. Yes. which I read before. I've handed it over just to make sure there were no. Well, problems. you wanted to make sure there wasn't anything revealing. Didn't embarrass in there. anything. Yeah, right. Not that I wouldn't, you know have any faith but <laughs> backstory of it's that my brother was out coyote hunting and he says the bastard snuck between me and my call and i almost stepped on him oh so i took my 357 magnum and hit him in the dome <laughs> so this that's great this rattlesnake is this the one my brother killed. shot and killed and taxidermied himself no to make you these amazing coasters you are kidding me really yeah so oh. What a there you pleasure. go. What a guy. There you what go. What a pleasure. I mean, so. these things are fantastic. If I They're mean, pretty got, legit. I, can we get a can we get a, a a close up? Anything closer than what we've currently got to take a look at these things? You guys aren't going to believe this. He is an engineer, so everything is of course perfect. I mean, if I made these, they would not look like that. They would they would be disheveled and <laughs> the wrong size and not nice. But he made them, so they're very nice. Uh, okay, here we go. Here's <laughs> here's the look. Look at these things. Yeah. I mean, just incredible. Rattler. And they're as smooth as silk. Oh, yeah, He did a great job. Very I thoughtful. actually went to his uh, place a couple months ago, and there was a jar of whatever you put this in to make it nice, of mm-hmm. rattlesnake skin on the table in the kitchen. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I must be back in Arizona. <laughs> like, like your life tolerates a lot that you just have rattlesnake skin sitting in some gross, like, something, like formaldehyde or some weird thing. And I was like, whatever. So that's, you know, he did a great job. Some kind of potion. <laughs> some kind mm-hmm. of potion. Oh, it well, nice. it's just, what an Made incredible nice. offer. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, and they just had a baby. Oh, Last, good for you know, them. So they have a, a brand new baby. Boy or they girl? Will, a boy. Oh. So they will be teaching him to also dominate the the animal kingdom. And the first time I introduced <laughs> them to your show was through the Thanksgiving extravaganza. Oh, is that right? I believe it was two years ago. So <laughs> appropriate timing, one week after Thanksgiving. Yeah. It well, is appropriate timing. Yes. It's become somewhat of a tradition here. Indeed. Uh, we, we love to do it. It honestly is our most fun <laughs> show of the year. It's so fun. Courtney must be an amazing girl. She my, is. My, she uh, is. My wife has sisters, and they have a younger brother brother paul who's married to uh, a you know a woman uh-huh. and uh they <laughs> thanks for the clarification there, there is a meme that they send around that's like you need to take care of this girl because after all she's married to your brother yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no she is wonderful and my brother is wonderful and yeah. we're happy to have them so. oh yeah. yes god we're so and excited the new little paul so p3 as we call it and That's so awesome. Good. And yes. you know what? Don't let Smug talk about a bear travel. He yeah. doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, about. 
Smog has high uh, standards for air travel. My brother may have higher standards. <laughs> all, I, all I know is that someday, God willing, Smug will have a child. Yes. And when he does, be I will the be there child. with my phone. <laughs> recording every second i think we'll probably have like the whole casting crew there to <laughs> cover it live we have cameras they can travel it's all i'm yeah. saying it's yeah like, i feel like at this point he's dug his own grave <laughs> and you be... know he's gonna fly southwest because when you have kids you have so much stuff that you need the free checked bags you yeah. need so the free it's inevitable that exactly that's happen. exactly inevitable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you need the free check they got the stroller the baby bag yeah. backpack another bag i mean you gotta well nobody knows money. better than our own michael duncan who travels like a like a uh, yeah like a pack mule you're you're, you're the human ant. You're just carrying things on your back, and you got them a above primitive your fly machine. Yeah, yeah. It's and then a they lot. get to the gate, and they're like, um, "I'm sorry, you have a third item that is the size yeah. of a wallet. You must put it in another bag. Even though they're going to take it right out of the bag before you get off the jetway." <laughs> well, you know what the worst part is, which I've learned now is, um, <clears throat> you know, we've got a um, like a seat that fits in the seat for our uh, our four year old. It just he, he likes it, you know, and it, you know if he likes it, we're That's gonna we're gonna bring it, but. You know, you buy one that's obviously like certified by the FAA and it's like you would never buy one that wasn't. In fact, all of the ones that they make are certified. Right. But like you'll have all of this stuff and you'll be coming off like from the jet bridge onto the plane itself. And there will be a flight attendant who'll be like, hey, let me um, let me check. Let me look at the certification on that. Uh, and like you're holding 10 things and your four year olds now halfway back to the bathroom. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's the worst. Uh, it's the why worst. the deterrence to travel. But is it gets so high. it gets more yeah. difficult. The one thing I would say for all listeners who have very very young newborns and stuff, that first six months is actually best. Pretty easy. Yeah. That's the best. It's pretty easy. So I hope try two. Yeah, one so two. Start is, moving around. That's yeah, where yeah. Problems come. Yeah, yeah. Two and, and talking and screaming. Mm -hmm. And three for boys. Yeah, it becomes an issue. <laughs> it becomes an issue. Three year old a little girls. Rowdy. Yeah. A little rowdy. Yeah, rowdy. Yeah. yeah. Totally. All right. So while we have you. Yeah, this is great. Let's just talk. I mean, this is such a fun, unexpected pleasure. Yes, it is. Thanks for having me the week after Thanksgiving. I was just going to drop off a gift, but now I get to be on the guest on the program, which I always appreciate. So thank you. Let's just the get The best in. listeners in the business. So. Yes. I mean, let's just get into what's pissing you off. Oh, man. Um, this Israel Hamas thing is pissing me off. I can it, tell. It We've really been following is. you. This yeah, is kind of why I prompted uh, this. It's... Not to not to get into the the downer mode right away, but um, the fact that they are you know holding American hostages, they're holding children still. Yeah. Um, that the pressure is not being applied by the Biden administration to allow Israel to do what they need to do to get these people yeah. home or to destroy this terrorist organization that persists. Um, and they're, that's they're what sending... it, it, let's be very very clear. Like this has been perverted here over the last since October seven. Where we've gotten to a point where everybody's calling, you have from the left ceasefire and mm -hmm. everything else, and then there's some this conflation between Palestinians and and Hamas and acting as though Hamas is like a governing body yeah. and not a terrorist organization. Yeah, uh, not only that, but condoning their behavior mm -hmm. on October seventh. Yeah. Um, if That's if disgusting. you are not a coward, you will watch the videos that they yeah. had in their own GoPros of yeah. slaughtering of children and mothers and the fact that they deliberately ra launched rockets out of Gaza knowing that people would go to their bomb shelters and then they the terrorists went to the bomb shelters and threw grenades mm. into the bomb shelters yeah. where families were hiding from their children. If you watch the music festival where they were executing and then raping women and you know point blank ranges and you have the UN now today the UN women's group being asked why is it you can't just condemn what has happened and she gives some mealy mouth bureaucratic answer about needing to investigate and blah 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 and it, What's it's just to investigate it, it, exactly I mean watch the footage from the GoPros of the terrorists right. it's all you need to know and I think what's bothering me the most is the West's enabling of this and this continued behavior agreed there's a you know the UN situation when they won't even acknowledge that raping women Israeli women is is wrong and also let's not forget that this isn't just about Israeli Jewish women I mean people from 30 plus different countries right. were executed on October 7th. They were taken into the Gaza Strip against their will, um, subjected to horrific conditions, which now many people are saying, oh, well, it wasn't so bad, um, as if they, you know, they're ignoring the idea that they were taken yeah. in the first place. And now you're seeing that um, the UN was involved in the situation by essentially giving aid to to 
Hamas, there's a story out today showing that one of the hostages was actually forced to stay with a UN UNRWA teacher in their home. Um, and the Biden administration comes out with a statement today and they met with the, the Red Cross and the first paragraph is all about the need to give Gaza more aid. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of the statement is about getting hostages home. And there's two things there. The aid they claim is going to be regulated, that they can verify it's not going to Hamas. Which that is, is a lie. That everything that goes into the Gaza Strip is controlled by Hamas. So if you're sending in aid, understandably because you're emotional about the fact you don't want innocent people to suffer, but you're enabling this violence, of the cycle of violence to continue for decades because yeah. they allow this basically subsidizing of the people so that yeah. Hamas can use their other resources to continue to attack Israelis. The second thing is that the Red Cross is also complicit in their partnership with Hamas. Mm -hmm. If you watch these videos of the hostages getting taken out day after day after day, they are surrounded in these vehicles without tinted windows by Palestinian mobs, mm -hmm. so much so that Hamas had to keep them away from the vehicles on day five of the release to make sure the hostages were kept safe when they were transferred over to the Egyptian authorities and, and then to the Israeli authorities. So just this this refusal to accept what we're dealing with yeah. yes. and then the continuing enabling of this when in 20, I believe it was 2021, um, the Biden administration re-upped aid for UNRWA, yep. admitting that a lot of the aid money, which we pay for, hardworking Americans go to work every day, their taxpayers are sent here, um, was going to be used for terrorism purposes. And they just shrug their shoulders and move on. They're like, oh, well. And so that's infuriating to me. Um, and oh, then mean, there's a component so of, of, of what it means to America to be allies with Israel, which is a whole other topic, which I'm happy to talk about. But no, we that's should really what it. is bothering me. We've tried today. to get into that. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we've tried to get into that a lot on this show because I look at with all of the problems that Americans are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, the economy, the inflation. Of course. You know, they're trying to deal with, with taking kids to school, not being able to pay for gas and everything else. It's easy to understand how people look at something happening halfway around the world and they're like, why do I care about this? You have to for the following reasons, right? It matters for modern day for lots of reasons for our national security purposes um the fact that if the region is devolving it poses a threat to the united states but on a deeper level you know you're seeing these pro hamas protests taking place all over the country students on university campuses who are jewish feel uns not just feel unsafe they are unsafe going to their classes they're being hunted down and mobbed in buildings so much so they have to close all the doors and yeah. tell them to hide in the mm -hmm. attic i mean that is atrocious behavior but the broader historical perspective and history really matters is why is it that the same players on the left who hate america black lives matter these far left professors yeah. why are they all of a sudden so anti-israel and it's because israel and the united states of america have a deep connection when it comes to the founding of this country George Washington and the Founding Fathers looked to the Promised Land, obviously not modern day 1948 Israel, but the Promised Land of the Israeli people and their freedom from Egypt mm -hmm. as, a, as inspiration to found the United States of America, to go up against the British Empire. And when it came to, when they won and it came to debate about what the, the seal of the United States was going to be, a number of them suggested you know, Moses leading people out of Egypt um, and references to the Bible of what it meant to have freedom in the promised land and what that offered them. And George Washington himself, and this is in his writings and, and his speeches, wanted America to be a place where Jews could be safe, where they were not discriminated against, for a place for religious tolerance, where people could come and be safe from the rest of what they had experienced throughout human history in the world. Yeah. So there's that component. There's also- Pesky First Amendment Yeah, talk, exactly, right? exactly. The other component is that I went to Normandy in June uh, with the Best Defense Foundation. I remember Foundation. seeing this, yeah. You, you, you and we kinda... escorted as caregivers 40 plus World War II veterans to the beaches of Normandy for the D-Day anniversary, the 79th anniversary. And you stand in the American cemetery and you see all of these graves, you see stars of David, you see crosses, people from all kinds of backgrounds. And you look at the way that America fought back the Nazis on the continent, literally from the ocean mm. across Germany to get rid of the scourge 
that was exterminating the Jewish people. Yeah. Um, my husband's grandfather was a medic in the U.S. military who was one of the first medics into Dachau to mm. wow. uh, to liberate Dachau. And that sacrifice of our U.S. service members from World War II, the greatest generation, yeah. was not to, fe to defeat the Nazis, but also led to the creation of the state of Israel, yeah. which we've had a relationship with um, since then and obviously before. So the broader context and greater history is, are we really going to throw all of that sacrifice away? Yeah. With in the men that I stood on the beach with, some of them who were in the invasion oh, what a great that point. day, yeah. <clears throat> we're really gonna just act like that alliance doesn't matter. And they honor that sacrifice there still. I mean, I went to uh, Normandy and the thing that always struck me was uh, every hour, on the hour, they play the American National Anthem. Yep. And you're sitting there in a cemetery, cemetery with people who fought on that beach. Yeah. And it really does drive the point home that, like, you know, that sacrifice is so important that the French government ceded that land, technically, to America. And every hour on the hour, the American National Anthem plays. Yeah. And it's like, we're just going to throw away all of our history and heritage and what we've sacrificed to get to where we are right. now. And, and when we were there, because of the anniversary, the French people in Normandy come out and line the streets by mm -hmm. the thousands as you're taking these World War II veterans through the streets and they are crying mm. and they are saying in their French accent, thank you for my liberty, thank you for what you did here. And I'm not willing to let that go. Yeah. I'm not willing to, to say that our alliances that were formed, especially when it comes to the state of Israel and what happened during World War II, should be just thrown out the window because there are these rabid, anti-American, anti-Israel, mm -hmm. far-left, anti-Western movements happening on college campuses who want to tear down the country and the yeah. fabric of this place. And the similarities are the, are the things that we actually have in common. Democracy, human rights, yeah, right. women's rights, all the things they claim that they stand for, they're trying to destroy. And so that, I would say, is the broader picture that is being lost a little bit in the conversation. But um, it, it, it's, I think history matters and context matter and that the sacrifices of the people who came before us uh, I'm a daughter of the American Revolution. Like yeah. those things matter, and totally. we should certainly bring them up in the context of why things um, should be preserved especially, and respected. I feel like especially for like the youngest generation, these Zoomers and stuff who don't mm -hmm. have the context of all of those things, right? right. Like I, you know, you we talked about it um, a couple episodes ago, but you know, the Zoomers on TikTok who are talking about how oh, well, this Osama bin Laden guy makes a lot of sense, and it's like. Part of it is it's a psyop from the CCP right, and you know the Chinese military, but the other part is like they don't have th that history and cultural touchstones to be like, no, that's wrong. I know what America is and what it stands for and what it's done. Right, Which sort of you know? blows me away, right? I mean, because in our families, I'm guessing, and I actually know, you grew up with a sense of history. Mm -hmm. you, you grew up with a reverence for america in and of itself but also the history that brought us all to the point where we are today knowing that an imperfect yeah. union is is trying to improve every single day and but knowing where you came from is very important to where you want to be and we've lost that right so it's else. also important i think that even like, by well-intentioned individuals mm, by the way but it's imp yeah. it's important that you know veterans speak up and and tell those stories mm -hmm. because i remember my grandfather he fought in the battle of the bulge mm -hmm. Um, you know, I he didn't tell me a single story from World War II. Yeah, my grandfather was the same until man. six months before he died. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I, you know, we did this like oral history project on the thing when I was in high school. Yeah. And um, you know, re recorded all that in audio. And what I wonder is like, would I have the same understanding of it if that if I didn't have that experience? Right. You it's know what I mean? Really good point. Mm -hmm. It's a very very good point. Yeah. I do wonder about that. Yeah. I mean, being a, a couple generations removed, three generations, four generations removed from that, does that in and of itself because you don't have a direct con? Yeah, it hits a little different when your grandpa's telling you that, and totally. he's like, "And I got back, and like anybody, everybody just want to talk about baseball." Yeah. yeah, and he's like, "Then I felt isolated, mm -hmm. and then that's why I didn't talk about it." Yeah, you know what I mean? Totally agree. Look, you can't blame people for not knowing something they've never been told right. or taught, mm -hmm. but. Um, obviously the education system is a complete disaster when it totally. comes to civics in this country and what they're deciding is important to teach and what's not important to teach. But it is up to, to us to tell these stories and to talk about how respect 
for what people who you never met or never will meet yeah. uh, or people who died on your behalf or sacrificed limbs, like why you need to respect that. You can disagree on politics, of course, and maybe the way that things are done. But this lack of respect I'm seeing from the younger generation about what it actually is yeah. to sacrifice something and to do really yeah. difficult things, I think is a really big problem. Yeah. Um, I don't think that they, you know, it's almost like they've had such a good life in America that they just, it's like they, it's they, they come up with like fake things to be really outraged about. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, and, it's a convenience of being able to. Right. It, right? it is. Yeah, we right. call it luxury beliefs. Luxury, luxury beliefs. You know? Luxury beliefs. But so. the reality is hist history does matter. Mm -hmm. Context does matter. And you mentioned the Red Cross a little bit ago. And a lot of people have been skeptical about the Red Cross's reporting of what they're doing over there in Israel right now. And for good reason, mm -hmm. going back to World War II, let me tell you guys something you may have seen floating around, but maybe not. Around the time of World War II, the Red Cross reported on the, quote, Jewish problem. And let me read you a headline from the Washington Post in 1944 that was driven by sourcing from the Red Cross. The headline was, quote, Nazis play fair in prison camps, Come on. comma, families told. And that is based on sourcing from the Red Cross in 1944. So people have a lot of reason to be skeptical about what they're hearing today. Yeah. Incredible. And they're doing it again right now uh, by, you know, claiming these people were treated fairly, not demanding they visit these hostages under international law to right. deliver things like glasses so people can see or medication so that they don't die from a life threatening disease that they may have. But also like just even pretending like these are prisoners of war. Right. These are these are exactly. women and children. Right. These are innocent people in kibbutzes around where they've attacked. I mean, in comparison to the quote unquote hostages which are prisoners convicted of terrorism crimes yeah. against the state of Israel. And that's the one to that's one, three to one swap that it, we've got going on. And that's the most interesting thing because you saw like after October 7th, there was 48 or 72 hours where the Biden administration like didn't really say anything and then strongly uh, condemned yep. what, what happened. And then very quickly, it stopped being a conversation about murderous terrorists who took people hostage and now it is you know we well it's the government of gaza right like yeah. suddenly they're not terrorists anymore now they are equal to israel and we need to be talking about how things look after the war and it's like how about we kill all the terrorists yeah how about all the terrorists are dead and then we can talk about what happens after that it's just they hold the israeli government to a standard that they don't hold anybody else <laughs> yeah. in the world yeah. to despite yeah. the country being in the worst neighborhood in the world um and being a very close ally that benefits us with technology and intelligence. And I think it's just a broader problem. Uh, I, re I read a great article yesterday about how Joe Biden is finishing what Barack Obama started in the Middle East, which is mm. a complete altering mm -hmm. of the landscape, which is so unfortunate because when Trump came in to the, do the Abraham Accords, there was so much hope for the future. And I still for think there reason. could be. Yeah. I mean, privately, you're hearing that, you know, the Saudis and 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 all these and some other countries, some of the Jordanians who have been completely out of control. Yeah, the Egyptians um, and, and that others. they want to move forward with, you know, peace prospects and business because they're tired of this problem. They're tired of the Palestinians having a veto on progress in the Middle East for their yeah. own people because they're beholden to these terrorist organizations. One more thing I'll say about what we're hearing from the Biden administration. They keep touting this delusional ivory tower two-state solution mm. well, we've that tried, has been we've a dc it. like you know like a, a eu dc think tank problem that mm -hmm. they've wanted to put into place for years that has never worked yeah and they want to do it now it's like okay so let's just let's just say we try to do this right with who yeah <laughs> with who? like with the with the hamas in the right. gaza strip with Hamas in the West Bank, who is in a, a right. civil war with Islamic Jihad. Right. Uh, Islamic Jihad, who is in a civil war with the Palestinian Authority, which is supposed to be the moderately recognized government in the West Bank. Oh, but by the way, the Palestinian Authority, after October 7th, celebrated the attacks and then told the imams in the West Bank to go out on Friday to incite more violence against Jews in the West Bank. Mm. So are you know, and then not to mention like the dozen other little terrorist groups that are on yeah. all yeah. the other parts of the border. So like with who exactly 
is a Western democracy supposed to have a two-state solution? Yeah, it's what, it's what Netanyahu. We've tried it. It's, it's what, like a basic thing. It's what Netanyahu always says. It's like just show me a partner for peace. Yeah, just like I mean, who, who who is it? It's been rejected, <laughs> and I, and I I feel like you know all, Palestinians are always the victims. And it's like at what at what point are they held accountable yeah. for rejecting five decades of peace deals? Uh, even even the Clintons right. say this over and over again. Bill Clinton himself says, "I bent over backwards to yeah, give them the, something." Yeah, with the Yasser Arafat. Yeah. Right. I mean, that was just as clear as day. Yeah. It, 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 look, somebody told me a long time ago that um, when the revolution ends, it's not great for professional revolutionaries. Yeah. And that's basically what they are. Yeah. Right. It's fight or nothing, and that's all they know. Yeah, at this stage, and so like, and it's a great jobs program when you got people like the Red Cross and the UN funding it. Fund. We're it. funding it. Yeah. yeah, we're giving them all the money. They're using it for terrorist activities, and their response is not to pull it back. Their response is to give them more, mm. and then to lie to everybody and say that it's not going to go to bad causes. Um, but generally speaking, I think everybody has been on the the right side of this for the most part. Yeah, we're the- seeing. The people who normally are very loud being loud. You have, of course, a couple members of Congress, the squad, being horrific as usual, but that's expected. <laughs> right. Um, but generally speaking, it's nice to see most Republicans and Democrats politically on the same team on yeah. this because it, it really does matter. Unity does matter. The, the, of the region and also the history of our country. Totally. So, I mean, thank so that's God what's you're... bothering me today. Thanks <laughs> for giving me a chance. Thank God you're working on this. I love having the clarity that you provide. Uh, before we let you go, what are you working on here? Uh, let's see. It's the week after Thanksgiving, so working on getting to the next holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Um, no, the debate is next week. Yeah. Uh, I believe we have the Newsom. Uh, DeSantis debate tonight. Yeah, yeah. Right, on mm. Hannity. Yeah, see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. Um, big so roll of the, the dice. Next, the, it is a big roll of the dice. I hope everyone's prepared. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll have to see. I don't hate it, and I've said this from the very beginning. I don't hate it at all. I thought there needed to be something done by DeSantis even before, sort of the the fall doldrums there, that you got to change the entire lexicon of which we're measuring a nominee when you're tra- yeah. when you're trailing by 30 it like se- nobody's playing for second place you know and you got to do something and if he shows up in a big way against somebody like gavin newsom maybe it does yeah and the format i mean i think it's good these candidates are breaking out of the rnc debate format i think it's better for people who are interested in hearing from more of them um the, you know you had the iowa forum that was last week or the week yeah. before uh, the RNC's not very happy that the candidates are doing this. I thought that was pretty good, era. by the way. Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah. Also, the Newsom DeSantis thing, it could be not be even about this election. It could be about yeah. the future. I mm. mean, DeSantis is very young. Or yeah, just Newsom ideological. is like, what, you know, not going to run apparently because of Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah. But like, he's going to run eventually. So, like, this is yeah. an opportunity yeah. for them both to, you know, go at it. And I, I'm actually the most looking forward to the red state, blue state debate. Because yeah. it's one that I think Americans have already made their decisions on. Mm-hmm. California is the number one state where people getting a U-Haul and leaving town, yep. yeah. leaving the state. So it'll be interesting to watch him try and defend that. And I'm, I think Sean will do a good job of fact checking him as well. Yeah, no, that's good, I mean, it's, it's good format. Fun stuff. You're yeah. not. Are you going to Tuscaloosa for this debate? I am not going to Tuscaloosa. No, we, neither are, are we. you guys going? No, uh, we're not. We're bummer. taking this one off. <laughs> We've got uh, Smugglesworth uh, is ob- obligated elsewhere. He's obligated. He's obligated. I don't yeah. know. Maybe you just have more connections in Miami just in case you get shut down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. Alabama has been pretty good to us. <laughs> I think we'd be okay down there. I think we'd be okay down get there. Get the fan glove out. Yeah. <laughs> the show must go on. Are you still doing your Fox Nation stuff? I am. Yes. Uh, I just did an episode in Texas three weekends ago. Nice. Must Successful. watch. Successful. It was good. Very good. Yeah. And then I'm headed to Napa in January. January for well, oh, a bird just a hunt. tough, a yeah, real a tough, tough <laughs> experience. Maybe, maybe, maybe shoot a couple of birds and I don't know, have a cab. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just have a cocktail in the lodge. Great, <laughs> right. so, it's been fun. So, it's yeah. my favorite did... part about your series is it's like, uh, well, we can just sort of hunt uh, luxury. She can, <laughs> she can do it all. <laughs> and then I'm just gonna go and hang out in my amazing hotel room, which has Egyptian cotton and. Uh, you know, looks like your hope. husband hates it too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I will say that last time around, and I won't give away the episode, but I had to hike a big mountain to get 
what I needed to go. So okay. it was <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this is so luxurious. <laughs> <laughs> back to my real hunting days. They put days. you to work. Yeah, back no. to my real hunting days, which is good. Which is good. Can't all be luxury and fun. That's so. exactly right. Well, listen, yeah. Katie Pavlich, I can't thank you enough for thank one you for bringing having this me. Yes. incredible. Thank Paul Pavlich yep. and uh, what a the great Animal brother. Kingdom. The whole yeah. Pavlich family. Good Lord. The there. thing tried to kill him. He had to fight back. He, yeah. 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 Well, and important. he did. And, and he did. did. And, and he did. did. So, Thanks for joining great us. Great to see you guys. You bet. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. So, thank God. I mean, God bless Katie Pavlich. Yeah. What a just a wonderful human being. She yeah. really she really is just the best. And she does. She wears so many different hats. She's totally. on Fox. She's got Town Hall. She's got books. She's got shows. And she's traveling. I mean, she yeah. really does it all. In addition to just being one hell of a person. Yeah. Very cool. That's very smart. Pure American. I feel like I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. We always do. Yeah, always do. I uh, love to see it. All right, so we also on Thursdays talk a little bit about who won the week. And uh, it's an interesting week to have this. We're coming out of Thanksgiving. We're in the final push here before the Iowa caucuses. And so I feel like this all means a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Smash, what do you got? Fellas, for the last few weeks, I um, my choice has been very plain and very clear. I feel like Donald Trump has won over and over and over again, but this week I have a new winner. Okay. Because this is about the winner of the week. And this week there's a candidate who has literally added an entire grassroots organization, and that's Nikki Haley, who won the support of Americans for Prosperity, which is an organization who we know very well at the Ruthless Variety Program as one that has thousands of people knocking doors, building relationships and communities around the country, and now they support Nikki Haley. And heading into Iowa, a very, very important first test in this presidential race, they support her and they're working for her, and I think because of that, Nikki Haley won the week. You know, it's interesting. I talked to some people on the ground not affiliated with Nikki Haley or AFP who I asked the significance of this, and they said they think it is significant because one of the advantages, obviously, the DeSantis campaign has had over her is their ground organization, and they've been at it for a long time Yeah, because they've had the capabilities and the financing of it um, through – you know, never back down, basically. And now this is, you're adding a lot of bodies to that. And so I, they agree with you. Yeah, and it, it's it's not just a stand-up, fly-by-night thing. These are people who have been volunteering and active in their communities for years. They have existing relationships, and that has an impact. Well, yeah, and, and, and to your point, like, they have a lot of activists. They also have state chapters in places like, Iowa and New Hampshire and all of that, right? So, like, there's infrastructure there that is real that will certainly be helpful for her. Mm -hmm. um, oh, man, what do you got? Uh, well, I have Ron DeSantis. And uh, I wish Smug was here so we could have our back and forth and then he could counter... Do you want me to just play Smug? You could countervail me on the other side, okay, maybe. Okay, maybe. Um, it's Ron DeSantis for a couple of reasons. I think, number one... You know, I, I think what he's going to do in this debate with Gavin Newsom is important. It's important for our movement. It's important for our party. It's going to juxtapose the failure of California and blue state governance with our conservative vision for America. Like aside from this presidential campaign, maybe it impacts it, maybe it doesn't. But I think it's like it is a good for our party that that voice be out there in prime time telling the American people what it is we want to do when we have the reins of power in Washington, you know, like, yeah. I think that takes a lot of courage and it's not going to be easy. Don't get me wrong. No, I mean, the guy's a serious debater. Yeah, no, Gavin Newsom is a, a serious, serious debater. So like, I got it like my tip of my hat to Ron DeSantis for doing it. The other thing, and the reason why he's my winner of the week is I think he is actively changed his uh, posture as it relates to Donald Trump. And this is something that like, I think all of us on the program have criticized DeSantis and others for is sort of like kids gloves yep. stuff right. for f f very, very long. And if you look at all the indictments of Donald Trump and he went up in the polls and all of that, I mean, that isn't a thing that was just Donald Trump. 
right? Like it was the whole ecosystem of the Republican Party and the other candidates not taking the shots when they should have, uh, you know, was a, buttressed him to where he finds himself today in the polls. And Ron DeSantis isn't doing that anymore. I don't know if you guys saw, but there was a leader of one of the Black Lives Matters uh, chapters that is going to be supporting Donald Trump. Hmm. BLM. I didn't see that. Yeah. Be like BLM Rhode Island or something. Okay. This guy was like, he's been all over Fox and all this sort of stuff. And here's what Donald Trump had to say about it. Spoke with Mark Fisher yesterday. A great guy. Very honored to have his and BLM support. Hmm. Wow. I have done more for black people than any other president, parenthetical, Lincoln. <laughs> oh. oh. Question mark? <laughs> In- Question mark? <laughs> Include... <laughs> Including ten He's year funding ten year funding for historically black black colleges and universities <sighs> where they had none, opportunity zones, criminal justice reform, and much more. Thank you to Mark. And Ron DeSantis quote tweets it and, and I think this is important. It's the distillation of the problem we've you know, that I think the conservative movement has had with Donald Trump on everything from this to, you know, abortion. If you say you like Donald Trump, then it's suddenly none of it matters, right? Like the fact that it's ideologically opposite of what we believe as conservatives doesn't matter to him anymore. But Ron DeSantis quote tweeted and said, BLM praising Donald Trump and Trump celebrating it makes perfect sense. When BLM was burning down cities and assaulting police officers in cities across this country, Trump did nothing but sit in the White House treating law and order. We did it differently in Florida. I didn't just tweet. I took action and called up the National Guard. We were not going to let them burn down our cities. As president, I'm not sit, sit idly by and let, and watch rioters torch American Ooh. cities. Mm. So That's... we sort of speak into the old man's heart in yeah, that. Yeah, right. And it's, a, it's something like that I have mentioned numerous times is like a real like clarifying moment in 2020 that we should have listened to Tom Cotton more than Kim Kardashian. Yeah. Like that is the thing with with Trump sometimes is – you know, whoever's in his ear last and praises him the most, he's like, suddenly that person's the good person, and they're not. Well, I here's here's my thought. I am also excited to watch this debate tonight between yeah. Ron DeSantis and Gavin Newsom. What I really hope DeSantis does is he pulls out that sort of side of his personality that we saw all during COVID, where he begins everything and he's just, you know, he's everything's buttoned up and everything is like, you know, very measured. And then all of a sudden he hears something and he just gets pissed. Yeah. And you can see it change in his eyes. You can hear it in the tone of his voice. Yeah. And he gets very firm and he says everything that people are thinking, everything they want to hear from a leader in this country, I really hope he pulls out. Yeah, you don't play this one to the draw. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, as my uh, standing in for Smug. Well, yeah, do you want to? You don't have to. You can well, I will. You want, pal. I will. Okay. Uh, I think it went to Vivek Ramaswamy. <laughs> <laughs> because you're just trolling the old man at the this dunking point. that has been going on in Michael Duncan's Twitter account, that in and of itself to me says winner of the week. He uh so he won the week because his uh what, his political director left for the Trump campaign? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe he had he had an odd social security number. Oh, oh geez. Oh my god. That is just a murder. I mean, uh, look, I I I don't cheer anybody leaving a job or I don't think this guy was fired. I think he did just leave or whatever and hats off to you do what you've got to do. Like there is no personal animus I have on that. I just think the Vivek Ramaswamy campaign is a fake campaign for president. <laughs> and so I'm going to continue to make that point as many ways as I can. Uh, all I've done here is allow the old man to do both a positive and a negative review this week. I just like <laughs> well done. Yeah. <laughs> I would just remind everybody, I'm not done. I won't be done. I would just <laughs> remind. I will, Let me finish. Because I, I made this comment earlier that I think all these campaigns really failed at a time in which Donald Trump was really vulnerable, where you could have a clear contrast to him and say, like, we have to leave the past the past and can't have a campaign that's a referendum on the challenger and his many indictments. And instead, Vivek Ramaswamy went down to Florida after the Mar-a-Lago indictment and held up a fucking TPS report being like, all the other candidates must sign this and pledge to pardon Donald Trump. And it's like, 
it's this the, sort of the theatrics, the sham wow conservatism of his campaign that has like I'm it, it's disgusts me. I find it distasteful. I don't think it's authentic. <laughs> Is that enough? Look what I've done. Yeah. <laughs> Look what I've done. I've riled the old man. That's Which, our, that's what we should do here. That's good, clean fun. Yeah, it's good, clean fun. So I'm going to go with uh, also DeSantis, but I'm going to go for a different reason than uh, what you had laid out. Uh, we've all seen the endorsement of Bob Vanderplatz yeah. in uh, this last week. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, this is a significant player in, uh, amongst the evangelical community, pro-life community within Iowa, which is obviously an incredibly important constituency. And what makes it more important to me is that they had that uh, candidate forum that Vander Plaats mm -hmm. hosted, which I thought was very well done, by the way. And I know the RNC and my RNC friends are gonna hate that, but I, I, I really thought it was, it was good because it allowed for a larger conversation. And look, Ramaswamy, for all the objections that we have as a show with the way that they've been running that campaign, that was the most authentic that I've seen him. I, no, honestly, and I know I give him a lot of shit, I 100% agree because it was the first time that Vivek actually like told his personal story and talked about his family. Yeah. Like I, what I don't understand is why. Like, no, he's got a great story to tell. You. Great story to stellar. tell. Right. Great story to tell. Right. When, 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 when you're asked like, why are you running for president? Like lead with that. Like yeah. talk about your family and what's at stake for the future of our country and the kids that you put to bed every night. And if he would have done that from the beginning, the whole tenor of his campaign would have been entirely different than, yeah, it, I than agree. it was. I thought that was a real high moment for him. The higher moment for me was Ron DeSantis's answer on why he's running and why he's contrasting himself with Donald Trump. And the answer that he provided there, which is about two minutes long, it's on the internet if you want to see it, to me encapsulated exactly why it is that his candidacy is so important to the Republican Party. Because he laid out the deficiencies of a Trump White House mm -hmm. and a continued Trump White House in a way that resonated deeply with conservative voters. It's not, you know, we're not talking Jan 6 here. We're not talking, you know, all the left-wing critiques. We're not talking about the indictments. We're not talking about... What we're talking about is the real reasons why you as a conservative should look for something new here. And I thought that was just super compelling. I mean, just really, really compelling. Yeah. And evidently it was compelling enough for within a short period of time, Vander Plaats himself coming out and endorsing the man. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big endorsement. I I have no idea. I, Iowa at this point is like a, it seems to me the most significant election, primary caucus, that we've ever seen in the Republican Party for the only reason that it, it it's like four people come in to leave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it feels like if you're in second place there and you put in a really good performance and you overperform expectations, whether that's Nikki Haley or whether that's Ron DeSantis, you've got a ticket to ride and you have a chance at consolidation to get a mano a mano situation, something we've never had against Donald Trump. 2016 didn't happen. This feels like that's coming down to it. And it feels like all campaigns have sort of put their chips in. But, ha Iowa. but have they though? Well, well, on Iowa, don't get me wrong, but have they put their chips in on going mano a mano with Donald Trump? I mean, I would, I would say, at least if you look at the ad spending, not yet, really. No, no. I mean, look, no. I think, I think that that that's why Iowa is unique. You know, in 2016, when we looked at this, I think it was, can you beat Donald Trump? And there were there were two candidates in Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio. Ted Cruz did, and yeah. Marco Rubio came damn close. And so it was a different calculus. This one, I don't think anybody's expecting somebody to beat Donald Trump mm -hmm. in Iowa. What they're expecting is that somebody elevates from the crowd. Right. And what we've seen with the exit of Mike Pence, with the exit of Tim Scott, are two extraordinarily well-known, well-regarded, well and well-funded candidates mm -hmm. that have gotten out before you would have normally in, in previous elections because of the consolidation piece of it. So I, I, I agree. Counterpoint, though. 
what's different between 2016 and now is it seems like DeSantis and Nikki are both fighting on the non-Trump side of the ledger. And the DeSantis people will tell you, well, we have crossover appeal. You know, we can get into that Trump base and win some votes. And that makes us more electable long term. But like Ron DeSantis' super PAC has spent $375,000 attacking Donald Trump. They've spent like 30 odd million dollars overall. Right. Nikki Haley has but it's a, spent it's a millions. Right. It's a strategic I, 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 right, I, I get it. What I'm what I'm trying to look at is beyond Iowa. They're, and it's like who actually gets to 50 plus one if they're both attacking each I other. I think what you're hit, Go ahead, John. But the, 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 their tactics aside, Iowa is very important. It doesn't change the stakes. No, and yeah, we I, talk, I, we've I, talked yeah. about this before on the show that this could be a Rocky four moment where Rocky goes in and he cuts Ivan Drago and he goes back to his corner and he realizes this is not a machine, this is a man, I can win. And if either of them or both of them finish close to Donald Trump, it changes the psyche heading into New Hampshire and South Carolina in a way that we haven't seen thus far in the race. Like, I, 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 think, I think Ron DeSantis needs to do extremely well in Iowa. Period. And I, I think it's very likely he does. Like, he's got Governor Reynolds' support. He's got Bob Vander Plaats. Uh, so there's institutional support in the evangelical community. And he's got a great ground game in Iowa. And the makeup of the state, I think, fits with him better than New Hampshire does, obviously. All, all I'm saying is you can end up in a situation where, like, Ron DeSantis performs just super well in Iowa. And then, like, you go into you know, New Hampshire, where independents and Democrats can cross over in an open primary and vote for Nikki Haley. And then it's like you've got two, you've rendered two decisions that are totally disparate with the two candidates who are attacking each other. I think that's possible. But alternatively, you could get something where you have some consolidation here. Yeah, maybe. We've seen that. That has happened where you have, I mean, look, before Christie blew up Marco Rubio, he was a distant third everywhere in the country. And he, between his finish in Iowa and then his immediate rise in the polls as a result in New Hampshire, he became sort of the other target. And that's what that's the reason why Christie suicide bombed the guy. Right. Because he was actually the target. And I think if, if DeSantis gets to a point in Iowa where it is that sort of mid-high 20s, he's within, you know, a stone's throw of Donald Trump, he could make a credible case that he could consolidate this thing. And if Nikki doesn't finish then a second in Iowa, if somehow Chris Christie ends up a second in you New You mean Hampshire, a, thir a third? Oh, yeah, yeah. In, yeah. in New Hampshire. Okay. Then that consolidation could happen rather quickly, right? I, I think- like, It's a high wire act. Like but Christie needs to figure out if he's going to be continue to be in this race, and I love him dearly, but if he's going to continue to be in this race, he needs number two in New Hampshire. End of story. Like, that's where that's, he put them all in. It's like Rudy Giuliani back yeah, in yeah. 2008 in Florida. Yeah. Like, you need number two. He, Rudy needed number one in Florida. If he doesn't get it, everybody knows what's going to happen there. And if that consolidate, we know that his vote, his share of the vote, that 15% or whatever, 10% in New Hampshire, is not going to go to Donald Trump. That's going somewhere else. More, most likely, if you look at the polls, it would go to somebody like Nikki Haley. Unless DeSantis Place is like a second in New Hampshire, it, in which case then your consolidation all of a sudden gets very, very quick. And all I think from the very beginning, what we've said is we expect the first three states to go as we imagine and as the polls say, where Donald Trump's going to win these. The question is, who is most formidable as a secondary candidate? And can you get close to a mano a mano before Super Tuesday? And if you can, that's a bunch of states people haven't done a lot of polling and a bunch of places that I think in a one-on-one -on -one matchup is a pretty interesting deal. And nobody knows the stakes in these early races better than the Trump campaign themselves. And yeah. that's why they professionalized in the way that they have in Iowa. That's why they professionalized in New Hampshire and in South Carolina. And they are not taking anything for granted because they know that if these opponents finish even close to them they know that there's a psyche that's involved in that that could could snowball they, into these middle states but, i mean yeah. that is true they are taking some stuff for granted though they aren't showing up at the debate you know so they are taking something for granted and it is a little bit of a prevent defense
Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. But I think those are all good. I mean, look, well reasoned. Well reasoned. As they usually winners are. of the week, as they always are. Uh, I want to flag this story for people because it's probably not on everybody's radar, but it's an absolute outrage. We've been following this relatively quick, closely at the uh, Ruthless Variety program. There is what they call the National Defense Authorization Act. It's basically the last bill that is going to pass this year. Mm -hmm. And probably the last bill that's going to pass for quite some time, unless you believe that they're going to do a whole bunch of appropriations and, and whatnot here in the first quarter of next year. But what that contains is a whole bunch of extraneous things that deal tangentially with national defense. One of the things that was included by House Republicans, thank God, was this ban of companies that reside in China that have a state-owned or state-affiliated designation that have been flagged basically by both Treasury and the Defense Department. And in particular, what these companies do is that they do biogenetic testing. So, for example, when your family goes and you're pregnant and your family goes and gets any sort of bio testing done to see if there is congenital issues, congenital anything issue. genetic. Yeah. yeah. Anything that's that, that could be problematic for your unborn child. It's done by one of two companies. One is an American based company. The other is a Chinese state owned company. Get the fuck out of here. No, no, it's, and, it's, it's, it, this is, this is a hundred percent true. Yeah. And I think what you're referring to is a story that showed up in the national review about how one particular Democrat who also happens to be in charge of reelecting all of the other Democrats who's standing in the way of an American effort to block these Chinese military connected companies from collecting American data. Yeah. It seems like a no brainer and, and on no planet would you ever imagine any politician sticking up for the Chinese military. But in this case, Gary Peters from Michigan, for some reason, seems to be blocking the American effort. Yeah, so so what's so, it's, so it's a DNA sequencing giant mm -hmm. that's based in China. And uh, it's taken part in, this is I'm quoting here from National Review, dystopian research projects focused on race, race ethnicity in tandem with the People's Liberation Army. Oh. <laughs> It so, sounds above board, <laughs> right? But like all of this happening in the shadow of COVID to me is just breathtaking. Like, How is it that we can get to a point where you as a representative, in this case of Michigan, mm -hmm. who's in charge of Senate Democrats reelection efforts, has taken a stand that banning a company that has a state affiliation with the People's Republic of China mm -hmm. that has worked in tandem, in tandem with the People's Liberation Army, should be doing business in hospitals across this country, unbeknownst to you, by the way. It's not like they give you a right. choice. There's there's no like uh, permission check box that you fill out and you're like, yes, I want my data to go to the CCP. Yeah, and, we, and we've read like these horror stories over the last uh, few months about how there's been data leaks and data hacks of things yeah. like 23andMe, where people pulled out uh, genetic sequencing of like Jewish people, for example. They've done that. Like that, that's a real story. That happened. Can you imagine a country being in possession of American genetic sequencing over a broad base, a, a generational base in this country? What's wild to me is that the guy who has been so active on this issue, Gary Peters, represents not just the Democrats in their campaign arm, but also the state of Michigan, where we have seen so much controversy over this Goshen company that's a, a Chinese-based electric vehicle company. Yeah. There, there are all these people in Michigan who are rising up against that. It's like, what is going on in Michigan that they're like, oh, yeah, Chinese military, check, we need more of that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, listen, I'm going to read a couple of excerpts from this. Uh, BGI created a neonatal genetic test with the Chinese military that enabled it to collect information from millions of people. That's according to Reuters in 2021. 
BGI was, quote, picked by Beijing to build and operate the China National Gene Bank, a vast and growing government-owned repository that now includes genetic data drawn from millions of people around the world, according to the Washington Post. BGI is required by law in China to share its information and data with the Chinese government. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I mean, why why is the head of the Democrats campaign arm so so animated on this? So so just to put a fine point on what you got to be concerned about is the House Republicans included a provision that would ban them from doing business here in the United States. This guy who has congressional jurisdiction on the Senate side in context of the National Defense Authorization Act cuz it's a technically a homeland security issue saw the proposal and tried to pocket veto it. He basically tried to try to just kill it. Yeah. And then when all these stories came out and credit to the national review for mm -hmm. this, they went out and asked him like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And they're like, well, uh, we need a, you know, we need a little something different. We're looking at, uh, we're, uh, we're going to try to uh, work in a bipartisan way to get something done on this, knowing this is the only bill that's going to pass. Mm -hmm. So like that's a, a stall tactic saying you're not going to do it in the context of the only thing that's going to become law right we're gonna but we share your concerns yeah like thanks for writing right basically <laughs> it is an outrage of the highest order there's senator bill haggerty uh of tennessee has been pushing this on the senate side gallagher's been pushing it on the house side these guys are doing yeoman's work and they're running into a committee chairman who is somehow thinks that it is a good idea to have a Chinese biotech company harvesting American genetic information here in this country and then, by law, sharing it with the Chinese government. So, wow. Democrats think they can get away with anything. If yeah. you're if you're in Tennessee, maybe uh, uh, lob in a call to, to Bill Haggerty. Tell him thanks. Thank him. And if you're in Michigan right now and you're listening to this, maybe call up old uh, Gary Peters yeah. and, and be like, maybe hey. Maybe a different message. Hey, why do you think my genetic uh, data should be shared with the Communist Party of China? It's almost as if they could, I don't know, manufacture some kind of virus. Yeah, <laughs> some sort of bioweapon. <laughs> or maybe share all that intel with, uh, I don't know, the Iranians who want to kill every Jew in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just completely ridiculous. All right, a couple quick things. You saw this tweet from Joe Biden that said Bidenomics is working, which you is so hysterical. Me. You've nice. got to be kidding yes. me. What yeah. is he thinking? I love it. Yeah, and I think we've got a graphic here. This is a, This is a fun little graphic. Uh, the experts, uh, Bidenomics is working. The reality, Americans need an extra $11,400 today just to afford the basics. <laughs> yeah. I mean, are you kidding me? This I, is, these people are so, this is what we've talked about endlessly, which is rather than trying to come to grips with the reality that Americans are facing, these guys keep saying everything's great. They always think it's a messaging problem. So they call their friends in the mainstream media and they say, hey, write this story the way that we need it written to make it look like the economy isn't so bad. Yeah. And what we all know is the reality, people stop reading the mainstream media because of that. And we all know that nobody who is living in this world paycheck to paycheck is getting any information from the mainstream media that supplants their day-to-day -day lives. <laughs> they know when they go to the grocery store, things are more expensive than they were totally. before. And th this is the way that the Democrats have always operated. Um, in 2016, everybody thinks like Hillary Clinton, you know, she lost... Uh, if you're a Democrat or you're in the media, you're like, she lost because Russia interfered in the election or... You know, maybe if you're trying to have some sort of nuanced take, you're like, well, she lost when they found that laptop from Anthony Weiner and they reopened the investigation into her, you know, her having these 30,000 emails and all that sort of thing. And that's the reason why she lost. No. Why she lost, I'll never forget this, was when they were doing the, the, the Democratic National Convention and one of the key themes of that was America's already great. <laughs> Can you think of anything more out of touch to say to struggling American families yeah. than America's, not, 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 not like her husband, not like Bill Clinton being like, I feel your pain. 
Yeah, no, right? it's the opposite. America's already great. Things yeah. are great for you. <laughs> don't. Why don't you think that things are great? So that's how Democrats have always been. The the one thing that this eleven thousand dollar number made me think of right away is an old Bloomberg story, and I say old and and scare quotes. In the spring of 2022, Bloomberg, a noted business reporting organization, said that inflation will mean that the average U.S. household spends an extra 5200 this year. That's 2022. Fast forward to 2023. 11000 In the CBS story, it's actually 11000 It's getting worse. Oh, no, but if, uh, easing. Inflation's easing. Right. As they say, it's just preposterous. Well, is working. Don't you all feel it? Why don't you feel it? Things are unaffordable, but the rate at which things are unaffordable isn't as high as it was. Michael, why don't you feel it? You don't. It's America's already great. You should feel it. <laughs> <laughs> it's absurd. All right, a couple quick ones for you. This one's my favorite. Community colleges and trade schools are largely void of Israel Hamas protests, is according to the Washington Examiner. I love. This I story. love this so much. I love this so much because it goes to the core of what we've been talking about for three years on this program. Higher education for decades has been trending, not liberal, but radically left. Uh, and they've got two guys in here that talks about talk about what's happening and whatnot. But the bottom line is trade schools and community colleges. No, no, you turns, can't find it. Turns out the people who go to trade school and community college are there for practical reasons as opposed to the basket weaving and gender <laughs> studies everybody gets at a liberal arts education. So valuable. So valuable in a modern four-year degree. But when you have like real problems and you're trying to you know, pay your way through trade school and maybe you're working a job on the side and you're thinking about the future for you and your family, you can't afford these luxury beliefs that have permeated higher education in so many of these institutions. It's what we've talked about forever. It's like, just like that radical at an Ivy League school has luxury b beliefs, those Islamic fundamentalists like Osama bin Laden had luxury beliefs. Guy was a fucking billionaire. You know, it's like the people with the least amount of problems truly are the problem. They totally are. Uh, here's the next one. Rashid Tlaib. Boy, she's a measured individual these days, huh? She released a statement. We can pull it up on the thing for you all to, to look at. I'm not going to read it all because it's absolute fucking nonsense. But in reality, what she's saying is that the imprisoned Hamas terrorists are political prisoners and children. Oh. Interesting. Interesting. Well, they're not, as it turns out. And what Israel has been trading for actual women, children, and political prisoners are people convicted of stabbings, of terrorist acts, and they happen to be Palestinian, and they happen to be affiliated with Hamas. And that that's just the reality of this deal. Mm -hmm. Just a complete outrage. It's just stunning to me that this is something coming out of the mouth of a an elected member of the United States House of Representatives. We went into this you know, in detail with Katie, and she is so well spoken on these issues and has been such a leader on Twitter. But it, I, I, I cannot get my head around this sort of like nonsense. I, nonsense. I don't understand it. It's complete nonsense. Uh, flipping to the next, and we do this one for Wolf because you know how Wolf it, it, he's like the only conservative that's come out of California. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Him and Ronald Reagan. Yeah, and, and, and he just struggles with this every day. It's just real tough for him. But I want to play this uh, uh, clip one of uh, Oakland residents openly supporting, supporting Hamas during a council meeting. Can we play that? There's not been beheadings of babies and rapings. Israel murdered their own people on October 7th. Calling Hamas a terrorist organization is ridiculous, racist, and plays into genocidal propaganda that is- Why are they wearing masks? We should be doing everything possible to combat. I support the right of Palestinians to resist <laughs> occupation, oh including through Hamas, the armed wing of the unified Palestinian resistance. As an Arab, asking with this context to condemn Hamas is very anti-Arab racist. The notion that this was a massacre of Jews is a fabricated narrative. Many uh. of those killed on October Thank 7th, you, your time is up. including children, were killed by the IDF. An amendment oh condemning Hamas is bald propaganda meant to... Thank you, your time is up. To hear them complain about Hamas violence is like listening to a wife beater complain when his wife finally stands up and fights back. Question. 
Did anyone else notice that those who oppose this resolution are old white supremacists? There's been a lot of atrocity propaganda ranging from claims of beheaded babies to mass rape. Hamas is not a terrorist organization just because the U.S. and Israel um, deems it so. Hamas is a resistance organization that is fighting for the liberation of Palestinian people and their land. <laughs> it's just stunning. It's just stunning. And, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind, fellas, the first thing that comes to my mind are all of the stories that we have read within the last few weeks about how the left-wing dark money outfits have marshaled resources into groups around the country. There's a, there is a New York Post headline that left-wing uh, organizations have funneled 15 million and more into groups in America rallying for Hamas. So these people are paid to say what it is that they're saying. I just can't wrap my head around any of those clips. I just can't do it. Yeah, it's like the depressing thing that we've kind of come to grips with here over the last six weeks on this show. It's like, it's one thing when there's people cheering and supporting terrorism in another country, but to know that your neighbor and the people in your community could actually get in front of a microphone and know they're being recorded and say that stuff is depressing. It's... <clears throat> Can we start with the fact that it's a fucking city council yeah. meeting? <laughs> yeah. You're there to fix potholes, for right. Christ's sake. Right. The Oakland A's just left because of this shit. Right. You, because they couldn't build a goddamn stadium. No. Because they couldn't keep the Raiders there a year before. These, this is, place is an absolute disaster. Right. We should sell it. We should cut it off from this country and push it out to sea. What the hell is that? I, you know what? I hate If you're anybody who's reasonable who lives in this area, I'm sorry. Get the fuck out of there. Because if you have to live amongst that kind of insanity, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know. What, you don't have any choice. You don't have any choice. This is depravity. Mm -hmm. It is not enough to be ignorant. It's not enough. Because that's not what that is. It's beyond ignorance. They're going to a city council meeting to just propagandize stuff that is inherently, objectively in fact, not only untrue, but shit that Hamas wouldn't dare say. No, they wouldn't dare say they it. They wouldn't because, dare say again, it. Again, like Katie said, like you don't have to actually hear it from Israel or the Gaza Health Ministry. Just look at the GoPro footage on the terrorists on October 7th. They did the thing. And you have people there being like, actually, the IDF killed all those kids. I mean, uh, you know, it's I, just, I, I, I can't, I can't. It's just this. I just can't. And I hope that there's just like those five people that exist in the world, but I know there's no, not. No, there's a lot more. But I know there's not. Garbage culture. It's a garbage cult. Just, I fuck it. I just, I like literally don't even know what to I do. know. I don't even know what to say. This Let's is why, it. this is why we drink. We got to. <laughs> <laughs> cheers, fellas. Cheers. Cheer cheers. Cheers to not being insane. Yeah. Huh? All right. Well, we're going to change the topic, uh, and we're going to go to uh, Disney adults. Oh. Yeah. We're going to go to Disney. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. We have warned of... I, all I want to say before you get into it is you listen to the Variety program because we help you see around the corner. Yeah. Okay? And that's not just politics. Ashbrook does a great job when it comes to the, the, the animal uprising yeah. but we have very early recognized the danger of the disney adult and now we're seeing that danger come true it has come to fruition and i believe we have a clip that will set this up oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Huh. there is a man look at that guy in the small world exhibit for our audio only listeners who is at present in a swimsuit and no shirt. And he is in the pool. He's in a pool. Now he has ventured outside. He's he's dealing with the uh, the stuffed mechanical toys. And he's gotten out. And there's like, what I love about it is it's like uh, the OJ car chase. You know, like they've got spotlights on him. Yeah. And oh, he's yeah. like there in a swimsuit in the swimming pool and there's like in you know, huge inflatable mushrooms around him. It's hilarious. Well, they got more than an inflatable uh, mushroom. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> How I just 
How about how about the lady? I I love the the voice of the lady who's I'm confident a mother. Their boat rounds the slow corner, and she sees him, and she's like, "Oh my god." <laughs> <laughs> what is this? I just paid five thousand dollars to bring my family here so we could disconnect and just give the kids something fun for a minute. And this lunatic is standing in his underwear in small world. Well, it got worse. So this guy ultimately disrobes, right, Wolf? This guy ultimately takes it all off. Mm. And he makes a small world a real small world. Oh. If you know what I'm saying. Well, he was in the pool. In his defense, <laughs> he was in the pool. I'm sure it was cold. Because we're a family program, we're not going to show you that component of it. I hope to God they clean that water. <laughs> Heavily chlorinated, I imagine. <laughs> I mean, some people, when they're on that ride, they might flip a coin into the water and make a wish. Yeah. <laughs> that is not what they're wishing for. <laughs> I can assure you. They not wish to have a small world presented to themselves as they round the corner on the, on the toboggan ride. Oh. Think about that lady. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> you're hanging out in the flume and next thing you know you've got this uh naked guy i mean they're i guarantee they're covering the eyes of their kids oh, they're telling them to terrible. look the other way and they they you know what they they deserve their money back that's why you need to bar any adult not accompanied by a child at disney world yeah that's it. It is. It's it, it is because we live in garbage a, culture. A garbage culture, a, a a Peter Pan culture <laughs> in which adults pretend to still be children and indulge a delusional fantasy where they can go to Disneyland without children and pretend this has been built for them. And it's not. <laughs> you don't belong there. <laughs> Especially with your parts out. Ugh. My God. I would have I would have thought that went without saying. <laughs> but again, garbage culture. Garbage culture. You have to say it explicitly on the back of the ticket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next one's no better, fellas. This one's gonna get even worse. Texas mom is fired from her job as a school sex educator after she was exposed as a convicted prostitute who still works as an escort. Yeah, she's really taking her work home, huh? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I have a lot of questions. This is from the Daily Mail. Uh, that was the headline that I just read. A Texas mom has been fired from a job as a sex educator after she was exposed as a prostitute and allegedly still works as an escort. Can I stop on that? Is yeah. there a distinction here that I'm unaware of? <laughs> am I? I don't know. Am I missing something? I. Uh, it seems a little redundant. Uh, seems Allegedly a little redundant. Allegedly, still works as an escort. Escort used to be a prostitute. Okay. Well, but it's the Daily Mail, and maybe the, it's like an SEO thing. They, they want to be very careful. They got to get the word prostitute and escort in there. Oh, so for it's a anybody click. searching anything, yeah, it's a click click thing. I think so. Ashley uh, Catcherside, thirty eight, from Godley near Texas, has been removed from her post as Godley ISD over two prostitution convictions in twenty twelve and twenty sixteen, known to her current clients as Lola Bria. The teacher now appears uh, to be working as a legal escort. Legal escort. So I don't know. Someone's going to have to define this to me. And an active website, escort mm. work, uh, mm. which is where clients pay for company. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And is permitted under Texas law while prostitution, selling sex, is not. Mm. So let me get this right. Uh, if you go to Texas and you are paid to go out on a date with a dude and then you have him to sleep with him yeah fair game sounds like a sweet leap loophole they've got there a little That's gray fair. area a little gray area you can buy her the steak but you can't pay well you can throw a, throw a grand down for her to come out buy oh, her steak. oh okay and then if she just so happens to choose to sleep with you hey, escort that's her decision that's an escort that's decision. just empowering yeah. for women yeah no I, well that's that's right that's right. Anyway, uh, she had since gone and taught at a school health advisory council. She health. was part okay. of the school health, health advisory council, which recommends health education protocols for students and school boards. Uh, the, that includes appropriate grade levels and curriculum regarding sex trafficking, according to the website. 
So uh, this lady uh, is, well, she's an expert. To yeah. be fair, she's an expert. Yeah. That's all we've ever asked of our ed higher education or even our <laughs> lower education is we find experts in their field to teach. Uh, and and so far, it appears that this woman is well qualified. Well, it, there's that <laughs> there's that stereotype: those who can't do teach, and she sort of inverted that. Yeah, she's like, I do and teach. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I don't know that she's like teaching the children. That's unclear to me. Hmm. Maybe she's part of the advisory board. I don't know. The way that the Daily Mail frames it is that she's a sex educator. Yeah. Well, I bet she has a very strong view of abstinence education. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Glad our tax dollars go to that. <laughs> Contraceptives, for example. Strong advocate. Mm. I would I, imagine. You know, I think this goes back to something. I think teachers need to be paid more <laughs> so they don't feel compelled to moonlight. <laughs> And so, nice pivot. Also, I like that. You also <laughs> moonlight. <yeah. laughs> you also ha you're also attracting a certain level of I love, people. I love that we're at who are interested. We're in at doing the, the job point because where like, they're going to be paid. Teachers need to get paid more so they don't whore. <laughs> <laughs> they got it. I mean, Randy. <laughs> Come on, Randy Weingarten's not doing her job. Teachers do not get paid enough in this country. It's only teaching and whoring. That's it. That's a binary <laughs> choice, and you you know you just got to keep paying. Unbelievable. Or you can't. You get the whoring. Unfortunately, <laughs> as Texas has found out. Good God, that's what a terrible story. All right, I think we're to play a game, fellas. Well, I think we have to, and because it is Thursday. Yeah. That can mean only one thing, and that is King of the Hill. Ah, oh, lovely. And lovely. Uh, uh, you have our defending champion, Matthew Dow. I do. I do. Uh, and Ashbrook, you're up, and I'm Judge. Who are you bringing to the table? Uh, this week, it's Bill Crystal. And I love episodes like this where our, one of our competitors, John Ashbrook, also gets to do the introductions. And so we must go ringside. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. It's time for King of the Hill. In the blue corner, fighting out of Pierre Omadier's checkbook for a chance to reclaim his crown. Bill War now, war forever, Crystal! And now, in the red corner, fighting out of his own Twitter account and current Champion of the world, Matthew Mail Pattern Dowd. Oh, wonderful. I love it. Just wonderful. Okay. Mail Pattern, the champion starts. Mail Pattern goes first. Okay. So this is from Matthew Mail Pattern. The folks today who complain, th I'm going to start Which with Exhibit 3. Exhibit 3. The folks today who complain about wokeness in our military and saying military is weakened because of it are of the same lineage of the folks who said the exact same thing when we desegregated the military. <laughs> Hold on. Mm. Like, you got to actually follow this. Mm. You got to follow this. It's not just that he's saying that the people who are complaining about like i don't know transgender yeah admittance and the idea that we need to do transgender education for the first infantry for example right and they need to be reading like white fragility yeah 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 it's not it's not enough that you can just say like i don't know that that's like their mission is that they themselves are a part of a lineage mm -hmm. that can be traced directly back to overt racism yeah. in our military, right. which dates back, by the way, to the Civil War Yeah, uh, of people complaining about desegregated military. <laughs> <laughs> Think about the gravity of that statement. Yeah. Think about all that encompasses. It's basically saying if you don't think it's most important that our warfighters read White Fragility, you're in the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Not only that, like you were for slavery. You were. You were <laughs> because for you go slavery. right back to civil so, yeah, war. The whole thing. <laughs> wow. Really wrapped it in a bow. 
Ashbrook, what do you got for okay, us? Okay, Nikki, we're going to start with exhibit number eight. Bill Crystal writes, uh, when I was growing up, the anti-American violence justifying conspiracy besotted types seemed mostly on the left. Now the anti-American violence justifying conspiracy besotted types seem mostly to be on the right. Either way, they're both, both deplorable and dangerous. So the right is now the worst possible thing, just as bad as the left. <laughs> Bastard. And in our and in our game, this is a former Republican who is comparing the worst of the left to the right of today, and therefore this statement fits better than anything else I've seen in quite a while. Hmm. Can I, hmm. <laughs> Uh, is it, counselor, is a counterpoint here? No, I don't have one. I I just I I appreciated bastarded. He, uh, what's most interesting in that for me is Bill Crystal has found himself on every side of every party at a various point in his career. It seems like people just constantly disappoint Bill Crystal. <laughs> <laughs> like he went from a liberal to a neoconservative to now just a liberal again. Just very, very concerned. Yeah. At all times. <sighs> And it's uh, it's well reasoned, Bill Crystal's tweet, and I appreciate it. I just don't think it can match up with what Matthew Dow did to our American military. It's an A bomb, <laughs> and that's an A bomb. <laughs> Round one to Dow. Okay. okay. All right. So Nikki, uh, for the first exhibit of round number two, I'd like to go to number five, please. This is again Bill Crystal. In 2022, Liz Cheney really rose to the moment in a historic way. In a less visible but very important way, Pelosi did too. No, oh, come on. The Dems mostly knew Pelosi was right in putting Liz front and center, but it wasn't so easy for them to accept and keep on accepting Pelosi stood firm. <laughs> and mm. He's quote tweeting something about Cheney. Mm. Wonderful. What do you got? So one of my favorite things about Dowd is his pullbacks of philosophers and poets. Yeah. And he does that with great frequency, but it's always a subtweet and a subtext of his own critiques of American political culture. Always. Yeah. It's not like he's just like picking these things out of thin air. It's like he, he has something to say, but it's best said by like a philosopher from the 1800s you're you're right there'll be these periods in which he's not active on twitter he goes into the lab the banger laboratory <laughs> and he's like how can i have some sort of cultural or literary touchstone from 150 years ago and then shoehorn in <laughs> yes. what he wants to say about right, donald right. trump or whatever i love it i can't but, wait to see but it. this one in its current context i think is just an absolute banger <laughs> Happy B Day to German philosopher. What, what exhibit? Is oh, this? it's exhibit number one. Yep. Happy B Day to German philosopher slash historian Frederick Engels B, eighteen twenty. He's got. To, he's got to be very clear. He knows the birthday. Yeah. No. And he's got the like the historical citation B, uh -huh. not birthday. Like, like a like a Wikipedia. Yeah. It's a B, eighteen twenty. <laughs> We're very very important to cite properly as footnotes. No nation can be free if it oppresses other nations. Terror consists mostly of useless cruelties perpetrated by frightened people in order to reassure themselves. Mm. Oh, boy, that's something. So, put into the current context of what Matthew Dowd's belief is about what's happening in the middle east this is axis of evil matthew doubt correct this is axis of and this is uh -huh. the, you just the bush you took, administration you took my next point mm. this is the axis of evil matthew doubt this is sounds the, like it's more nuanced now this is <laughs> <laughs> it is indeed a nuanced take. it is it is indeed a nuanced take, but what he didn't do is put out a press release in praise of Nancy Pelosi, the most partisan figure on the Democrat side. I, I, I agree about that, Ashbrook. And it is interesting when Bill Crystal comes in 
in like a process story defense of the democratic establishment like why, wild that he do, he does that now like feels the need to insert himself into a discussion of Liz Cheney and Nancy Pelosi and like we got to defend the honor of Nancy Pelosi that is absolutely wild it is also sort of par for the course for him it feels like a five iron yeah no nation it's just can it, be free it, it, it it's just a banger nations. it's a banger dowd banger banger <laughs> banger two round knockout matthew <laughs> dowd i'm sorry pal uh, the guy is just he's short and sweet boy yeah. he just really delivers it he goes on you know like he said he goes back to the laboratory he works yeah. on some things and then six months later he reappears and he puts a hot streak together yeah, yeah it's tough to beat oh that gosh. is tough to beat guy's just good and i had a third banger there that was just i mean the guy's got everything you know <laughs> he's just got everything you need <laughs> fellas i think we may have done it here i think we have and i think it's only appropriate given smug's absence that we go to hollywood hen to get us out of here another banger of an episode folks so until next time minions keep the faith hold the line and own the libs we'll see you on tuesday Stay ruthless.